With the success of massive multiplayer such as Nexus The Kingdom of the Winds released in 1996 and Ultima Online following shortly after in 97, it became clear that there was a bright future to be had in online RPGs. In 1999, EverQuest exploded the genre stateside. The same year, and immediately after completing Chrono Cross, Square began to test the waters of the online universe. The developers of the company's first venture into the World Wide Web had quite a task ahead of them. Final Fantasy XI went into public beta testing in Japan in August 2001, only months after the release of Final Fantasy X. XI was one of the first games produced under Square's all-platforms, all-media ideals. This meant the game was designed to be enjoyed by gamers of different languages, localizations, and even platforms. XI still remains one of the only MMORPGs to accommodate players from all over the world to engage each other on the same servers rather than making certain regional distinctions. But Square's full plans for global connectivity wouldn't be fulfilled for another four years. Final Fantasy XI was officially released for the PlayStation 2 in Japan on May 16, 2002. The project was directed by Koichi Ishii, known for his work with Chocobos throughout the series, and produced by Hiromichi Tanaka. The patrons of the series, executive producer Hironobu Sakaguchi and image designer Yoshitaka Amano, also lent their expertise to the project. Nobuyoshi Mihara joined the team as a lead character designer, and Kumi Tanioka and Noishi Mizuda assisted Nobuo Uematsu with the massive score. Mizuda ultimately composed the music for the expansion packs that followed. At launch, Final Fantasy XI began the saga of Vanadil and the continuing mystery of its creation. Long ago, saddened by the vanity of an ancient people known as the Xylart, the goddess Altana cried five tears, which bore unique races that would eventually form the backbones of three mighty nations. Without warning, a being known as the Shadow Lord released hordes of evil forces against the territories from his obsidian throne in Zarkabard. Each struggled with their own battles until the Archduke of Juno, a fledgling metropolis, united the nations under one banner, and eventually the Shadow Lord was subjugated. The story of Eleven began 20 years later. Players started by choosing their race, nation, and name. Servers were assigned, and world passes were needed for friends who wanted to play in the same realm. After a brief introductory cutscene, the inexperienced adventurers were faced with an expansive city to explore, and a hefty quest to begin. In the west, the Quan Continent gave rise to the Republic of Bastok and the Kingdom of Sandoria. Bastok, the youngest of the nations, was a place of ingenuity and development, and home to Sid the Engineer. Carved into the mountains of Gustaberg and nestled against a southern shore, Bastok relied on invention to battle the elements. Here, the innovative Humes researched new technologies as well as studied the artifacts of the past, while the mighty Galka sought refuge from a civilization abandoned and forgotten. To the north, in the forests of Ronfar, the ancient kingdom of Sandoria stood as a testament of time. The once proud empire had fallen to years of turmoil and political intrigue, complete with an aging king and two warring princes. Across the sea on the continent of Mindardia, the mystical Taru Taru settled the Federation of Windurst among the plains of Saruta Baruta. Naturally akin to magic and aligned with the teachings of the Star Sibyl, the Taru Taru built their city surrounding Heaven's Tower, a giant magical tree. After the ravages of the Crystal War, several Mithra, known for their agility and instinct, sought solace among the Taru Taru and were granted haven within Windurst. Connecting the continents in the midst of a massive span of bridges sat the Grand Duchy of Juno. This once meager fishing village was lifted from obscurity by the Archduke Camlino and his advanced technology. The spiraling city was a focal point for adventurers and provided air travel to the major nations. Eleven borrowed numerous conventions, including a number of different adventuring types, party-oriented fighting, and attaining powerful gear as well as improving on several aspects of the genre, including chat systems, monster aggression, character weight and animation, and item creation. Eleven also featured in-game cutscenes that triggered when certain conditions were met, and it employed a fairly intuitive auto-translation system, both of which are still unique to Final Fantasy XI. In 
order to see the wilds of Vanadil, players were once again called upon to master various jobs. Eleven is one of the first MMORPGs to allow players to completely change their online professions, while maintaining previously earned experience. In addition, players can unlock the ability to set a sub-job from any of the classes they had previously leveled. These were always capped at half of the player's main job. Balance became a big issue in the ever-changing online world. The jobs had to look and feel like their traditional Final Fantasy counterparts, while maintaining an equal playing ground for characters of similar levels. As a result, some received a noticeable shift in power. Classic jobs or abilities were incorporated into other jobs due to their specificity or limitations, as well as trying to make 50-plus levels worth of time playing that job interesting such as a Red Mage's ability to enchant weapons and cast spells traditionally dubbed Time Magic. At the start of their adventures, players could choose from the six Final Fantasy basics, each easily filling an MMO niche. Warriors served as solid tanks, monks brawled with the enemy face to face, thieves maneuvered themselves for expert damage, white mages were naturally adept healers, black mages blasted the enemy from range, and red mages were their usual jacks of all trade. After recruiting experience, players had the option to undergo another Final Fantasy tradition, searching for new jobs. After seeking out a specific NPC and performing any number of tasks, level 30 players could follow the paths of the Paladin, Summoner, Dark Knight, Bard, Ranger, or Beastmaster. Although Eleven's focus was certainly multiplayer, there was a fairly linear story that unearthed the origins of Vanadil. Each nation had its own set of missions and its own point of view of the beginnings of the main story, which told of the treachery of the Beastmen as they attempted to call forth the Shadow Lord within their respective strongholds. Completing these missions increased the player's rank and bestowed certain privileges, such as the ability to ride an airship. While gathering experience, players could also participate in Conquest, which earned glory for their nation and presence for their packs. Players could rise to level 50, and a number of important quests were hinged on level requirements. At 18, you could acquire your sub-job, at 20, attempt to tame a chocobo, and at 30, start hunting for extra jobs. While chocobos served their usual purpose of easing the cross-continent strain, friendly moogles were given the important duty of keeping track of your online affairs, including switching jobs, managing your inventory, and furnishing your own online abode, which could be decorated with furniture and various objects. In addition to Final Fantasy XI passing over the Pacific, Vanadil's borders were first expanded in 2003. Rise of the Xylart, originally entitled Visions of Jurat, was released in Japan at the same time as the US release of Final Fantasy XI, which included both the original Japanese launch content as well as its first pack of bonus material. The level cap of 50 was lifted, and after players completed some fairly arduous tasks, they could advance themselves to level 75. Rank was also increased from 6 to 10, and players could now complete the sagas of their various nations, which required them to trek through many of the new regions. The world of Vanadil got another familiar Final Fantasy wash with the addition of artifact armor. On the climb from 50 to 60, players could complete a series of quests that rewarded them with powerful sets of armor germane to their given job. The artifact armor was steeped in Final Fantasy mythology. White mages wore white robes trimmed in red, warriors bore limber red plates, black mages donned conical caps, and red mages sported familiar regalia. If that uphill climb wasn't enough for dedicated fans, Rise of the Xylart also permitted training as a samurai, ninja, and finally dragoon. In addition to conquering new jobs, summoners could also master their own. Rise of the Xylart brought Vanadil's celestial avatars from their slumber. With a strong party, players could challenge these beings for a number of rewards, including the ability to summon them in battle. For proper balance, each of the avatars was aligned to one of the elements that govern the game. Truly masterful summoners could also hope to conquer Fenrir, one of Vanadil's terrestrial guardians. The world of Vanadil nearly doubled with the additions of Zepwell and Elshamo Islands. Players could also visit the tropical Mithra homeland Kazam, as well as the ravaged Galka capital and the pirate haven Norg, where another Final Fantasy All-Star dwelled. The saga of Vanadil also continued on in a series of new missions designed specifically for the Rise of the Xylar content, which spanned a massive amount of terrain, eventually enabling the player to activate a portal to Talia, the ancient floating Xylar capital.
In 2004, the world grew again with the release of the second expansion, Chains of Promathia, in the US and Europe. Chains of Promathia began an intense and complicated series of missions that started tying up many of the mysteries put forth up to that point. It told the story of a Tabnazian girl named Preesh, a dark and sinister young boy, a gathering emptiness, and a long-forgotten prophecy for telling the coming of the twilight god Promathia. While no untouched landmasses appeared in Vanadil, new areas were discovered by adventurers for the first time. These included many that were accessible by everyone, and after the completion of certain missions, they could attempt to visit the ransacked countryside of Tavnazia, seek refuge in the survivor's safe hold, explore the destruction at Cape Revern, and eventually open the gateway to the celestial capital, Altayu. Even though no new jobs were released with Chains of Promathia, the expansion contained a wealth of content. Promathia was also notably more difficult than prior adventures, requiring an enormous amount of time, commitment, skill, and friends willing to help you out. The payoff was well worth the effort, as Promathia rewarded players with new exclusive areas to explore and plenty of plot puzzles to solve. Diligent summoners could also attempt to challenge and command a new avatar after certain mission requirements were met. Square finally fulfilled its original promise of all platforms, all media in 2006 with the release of the third expansion pack, Treasures of Otter Gone. Along with the expansion, Eleven was also released for the Xbox 360, marking the first time a Final Fantasy game was available for each console on the market. The expansion opened up the waters to the eastern empire of Otter Gone, a land even more shrouded in secrets than Vanadil. Ruled by the enigmatic Empress Najmira, the fortified city of Alzabi guarded a mysterious artifact known as the Astral Candescence, which provided its citizens with enhanced powers and was under constant siege by hostile new invaders. Otter Gone also provided new jobs to master with the addition of the eagerly awaited Blue Mage and newcomers Corsair and Puppet Master. Treasures of Otter Gone took notice of current MMOs on the market and drastically curbed the difficulty levels from Chains of Promathia. Each area in the expansion was available for all players, provided they could survive the trek, and hunting in the wilds was quicker and more efficient due to a number of new system changes, such as the inclusion of an experience bonus, as long as the city maintained possession of the Astral Candescence. Since then, a number of small content additions were added that are not technically part of any expansion. These included raiding the Dream Realm of Dynamis, certain seasonal events, and PvP excursions like Ballista. Treasures of Otter Gone added a number of other games and events that focused more on teamwork, such as Besieged, Assault, and Salvage. Several technical changes were also made, including infamous attempts to rebalance some of the jobs. Eventually, a reduction was made to many of the difficulty aspects of the missions from Chains of Promathia. Chocobo breeding and racing became available, and the option to choose a server upon character creation was added. As it stands today, the community of Final Fantasy XI is over 4 million strong, with hundreds of thousands of adventurers heading online every day. Starting in 2004, Square sponsored an annual fan festival where players could leave their virtual selves behind and greet their online allies in person. The events following have included live multiplayer challenges, cosplay contests, concerts from the Star Onions, a band starring two of the composers from the game, and sneak peeks at upcoming expansions. Despite featuring the most elaborate storyline and immense world map the series has ever seen, Final Fantasy XI was generally shunned by even the most dedicated fans of the franchise, who scoffed at its unconventional inclusion in the Roman numeral legacy. Criticisms were mostly laid upon the persistent grinding needed to ascend through the game's ranks, along with numerous unpredictable elements common to online play. Final Fantasy XI is also a very unforgiving experience, making you work your tail off for most of the landmarks in each job's progression but some would argue that that's what makes its achievements so rewarding when the battle is finally won. Contributions from the active population and extensive expansions like Wings of the Goddess ensured that Vanadil would keep growing as long as there were heroes brave enough to protect its lands and adventurers bold enough to seek out its secrets.
Join us next week as we make a pilgrimage to the plains of Ivalice, a world epic enough to cross over four entire games. These include the original tactical voyage, an action-adventure murder mystery, a handheld fairy tale, and the 12th and most recent installment in this groundbreaking franchise. Thank you.